I think we need to understand where the manual therapies actually fit within the healthcare paradigm. I'm a firm believer that safe interventions, low cost interventions, non-invasive interventions like the manual therapies, exercise, etc., it should be an early option for people with musculoskeletal problems. So understanding where it fits in that care process for the bulk of our patients with musculoskeletal problems, that should be an, an essential teach, I think. All right. Well, welcome to our listeners. Welcome to AOMP Hands On, Hands Off, where we're exploring these cutting edge ideas and trends in orthopedic manual physical therapy. And I'm your host. Uh, I have the pleasure to have uh, Chad Cook on the show, which I am so excited for. Um, and for our clinicians and listeners, what an exciting opportunity uh, to have you learn a little bit more about manual therapy for better communications with your patients. And so, for those educators that are listening, whether you're teaching entry level or advanced um, post professional clinicians, Tad's discussion and his insights always help prepare the next generation of physical therapists. So we're so excited to have him on the show. And if you may be living under a rock, you may not know that Chad is an internationally recognized expert with his four textbooks. Um, he's taught in over 40 countries and significant publication numbers. Um, this is a man who's truly transforming the way that we think about manual therapy. And I think you'll find him uh, a delight to listen to. And Chad is not just a researcher, believe it or not, I don't know where he finds time to do anything else, but he's super engaged in active life, which he is a biker and gets out in the mountain biking through rough terrain. So I'm gonna bring this a little bit of an analogy. Chad, you've helped navigate some rough terrains in manual therapy, some of the swinging pendulum, whether manual therapy is a good thing, a bad thing, to use it, to not to use it. Um, and yet you are injecting more knowledge into this area than anybody else I know. So we're so excited for you to help us navigate a little bit more of these challenging terrains and, and maybe relate to us um, some of the frameworks that we can use either as clinicians or educators. Um, and finding that perfect balance like you do on a mountain trail. So um, if you're all right, I'll go ahead and kick us off. And I would love to know more about this. So when I first contacted you, uh, you said you want to discuss the scaffolding of manual therapy. So what does this actually mean? First of all, thank you for having me on. And, uh, and it's wonderful to see you as always. And thanks for everything you do for AOMP. Oh, my um, scaffolding to me is it's a term we use um, in our NIH U24 about really building the framework and the taxonomy around manual therapy. I, I think historically, when you think about manual therapy, you think about efficacy and effectiveness studies, or maybe, you know, who manual therapy may benefit, that sort of thing. But there's a lot more to it. There are the treatment mechanisms, what actually happens with the particular treatment. Um, there are all these other disciplines involved in measuring manual therapy, like biomechanists and neuroscientists and imaging specialists and all these folks. And we're all using different language and our assumptions are all different. So the scaffolding is, is essentially structuring um, a framework around manual therapy so that we can all study it consistently so that when somebody is talking about something, another profession understands what we're talking about. It's about building um, almost a foundation and then the scaffolding up on current study um, so that it makes sense. That's great. So so you were relating this to your current grant and, and work that you're doing. So is that what led you towards your most recent efforts looking at this as a framework around manual therapy? Yeah, so you, you probably know that, I mean, my original manual therapy textbook took a crack at trying to harmonize some terminology and, and really talked about all the different philosophies. And that, that's very, I think, a, a clinical focus. What we're doing now has even um, a preclinical and a basic science focus embedded into it as well. And if I could use, if I could use an analogy, um, when, I, when I presented at NIH in June, I started off my talk um, using the, the Christian Bible, parable, the Tower of Babel. And I'm not going to get all the religious, so don't worry about that. <laughs> but in the Tower of Babel, people think that this is where all the people got different languages and that sort of thing, because God was angry that he was building a tower to the heavens. But in reality, if you read the Bible, it actually says that this is 
God's attempt to confuse people, confuse the workers so they could not finish the job. And that's really what I mean by this is there's so much discrepancy, so much a lack of harmony around what we say we do and what we actually do and how it's studied and and what people say to patients and all of these other things that that's really what we mean about around the scaffolding. It's, it's about, um, and it, and yes, it's very much triggered by the, uh, Forcenet grant, the U24 that we had. Um, but I think it's a continuation of something that I was doing, you know, a good 18 years ago too. Yeah. You know, I think, yeah, I remember even just teaching with you, Chad, and I think one of the biggest things that you've always said is, you know, consistency of language, like what are we actually saying so that it has meaning? and that we can understand right in the written word especially in our publications like the terminology and so i love that that's come back even 18 years later and you're putting more to it and it's really part of the the grant that you've had so i think that's that's wonderful how does this challenge traditional teaching methods maybe that clinicians or educators have followed for years and maybe you can kind of highlight some of those discrepancy areas that have caused some concern i mean that's a great question i you know, you and I spoke together, I think, at CN, CSM earlier this year. And one of the things that I had mentioned was that um, science really started to catch up, I think, with the theories around manual therapy in 1990, um, so that we had enough sophistication in the science to actually explore some of these concepts, terms, assumptions uh, that you saw with many of the philosophies around manual therapy. And unfortunately, the science actually identified some areas where we were flat out wrong. Um, we had these vanguards, uh, manual therapy philosophers who they saw something in the clinic, they knew it was meaningful. And what they did is they tried to backfill it with these ideas. And, and unfortunately those ideas, many of those haven't really stood up over time in science. The challenge I think comes when in the educational classroom or uh, postgraduate or whatever, when we're still using outdated uh, taxonomies or terminologies to try to train individuals or try to apply um, a philosophy that really doesn't fit onto that um, patient that's in front of you. So we're running kind of budding into some of these concepts with, uh, with what we're identifying within the Forcenet U24 um, with some of the publications that we're putting together, but we're also butting heads with some basic science research too as well that um, suggests that certain things happen and because they happened in a mouse in a controlled environment that it means it's going to transfer to you know a clinical environment you know there are all kinds of areas that need tightening up and, and need the appropriate scaffolding for us to actually build upon that and move forward so you know already with this this grant you're describing basically all these professions or disciplines i should say coming together and and finding out you know, debunking some of the ideas or the myths or the theories or the approaches, right? And understanding some of that language. So I think language is super important. How does that relate a little bit more maybe to the clinician and, and, and how would it refine maybe clinical reasoning or treatment planning? How does it have a direct impact on them? Maybe our listeners or who are in the clinics today. I think it has a lot of different ways. You know, to me, in one of the ways that we, um, we look at clinicians as another form of expert, all right? So mm -hmm. around manual therapy. So they have a domain of expertise, just as an image, imaging specialist has a domain of expertise, as a neuroscientist has, has a domain. Everybody has these different domains. And it, the, you know, when the cogs start working together and everything, everybody is communicating and everybody agrees on something, then we have a common language. We have a, a common statement so that policymakers understand what we're doing, so that the patients get a, a real story behind what this is. The challenge is, is when we're independent of one another. And right now it's, it's fairly independent. The, this weekend we had a, a summit and in the summit we had all of these different professions and we were intentional about inviting people that had um, a foot in the space of four space uh, manipulations or manual therapy but didn't necessarily collaborate with any of these areas. We had clinicians talk, we had imaging specialists talk, we had biomechanists talk, we have neuroscientists talk. We even had a basic scientist who worked only with mouse studies talk to tell you all the things that are wrong with mouse studies. And it was pretty, and we even had a, a psychologist, a person that had a psychological background. It was the most dynamic meeting 
in the, of, of all these people interacting with one another. So how can it influence a clinician? There's so, such a rich amount of knowledge in these other fields that could influence our interactions with our patients so that clinicians can learn from these individuals, just like these individuals learn from clinicians. And our, our goal is, is to, to get that optimal connection, harmonize it the best we can, and then be able to you know, better improve the way that we manage our patients, understand better when to use manual therapy in the patient process, and really tease out, is, it, is manual therapy doing what we think it's doing? So basically, I mean, you're asking in, in clinicians, it's, it's challenging right there in the day to day. So to reframe some of this mindset or ideas, right, seasoned clinicians may have had practices for a long time. And, you know, new clinicians are coming out um, from maybe entry level may not have been exposed to that. So where would be some places that, um, you know, how could some of our audience gain insight to some of those different perspectives? Um, where are some resources that they should lean into? Yeah, I think the first thing they need to do is be willing to go outside their um, narrow band of knowledge or training and, and learn from these some of these other professions who specialize in different areas. Um, just before this particular podcast, I was listening to the University of North Carolina had a, a seminar series and they brought in a speaker from the University of Delaware. And she was... Um, a, an imaging specialist who has a bond mechanist background, and she was talking about the three different tendons affiliated with the Achilles. And so a couple things with that, all right? First of all, I didn't know there were three tendons in the Achilles. Um, I didn't know that until last weekend. And then secondly, I, I learned a lot about fail rates across those, about how, how age influences that, about how prior injury influences that, and all these other elements. This is somebody outside of my profession that gave a talk that is going to be meaningful for me moving forward um, when looking at that. So the first thing, definitely, you know, be open in the way that you um, learn and learn from people who you think may not actually contribute. I think we've done that really well as a profession for psychologists and really looking at that part for pain science specialists. I think we've been very open on that. But I think we've ignored uh, maybe some areas that can be really beneficial, like imaging and, and then biomechanics. We've kind of poo-pooed biomechanics and pushed it off to the side. But there's actually more there than I think um, people recognize. Um, the second thing I think we can do is really challenge ourselves on some of these traditional paradigms that we learned from. Um, I mean, everybody essentially has some background where they've learned from mm -hmm. some philosophy. Mine is Maitland. Um, so I learned very much a test, um, retest. retest philosophy and mm -hmm. um, ignoring, you know, ignoring the complexity and then going toward more of the simple, you know, this is what we found. So we're going to move with it. Um, I think it's OK to have that as a, a foundation, but to recognize that those have major gaps and to try to fill those gaps with as much science as we can tackle. Um, I without paralyzing ourselves and, and trying to find um, a single answer. I, I really, I spoke to a, uh, at IFOMP, I spoke to someone who I really respect and we just kind of ran into each other. And the person said, you know, I appreciate what you're doing with mechanisms, but I'm not a hundred percent sure that we're ever going to fully understand how manual therapy works. And I said, I agree, but the journey is a wonderful experience and the, the learning from that as we go along is I think going to make us all better clinicians. Right. And so you may have this huge amount of knowledge. You may still use the same frameworks to go through in a clinical practice time, test, retest, right? Because if you're still using patient response, you might find something there. But maybe at a point where we're not finding the right information or the patient is not responding, certainly requires us to step back, reframe, and think again about what are we missing or what might else be going on here? Because certainly that's been some of the challenges that, you know, we have a great amount of who responds and then we have these non-responders. And, and so maybe it's worth that exploration. I think you gave a great perspective. You got to step back and like look at maybe what else could be going on there. Maybe something you haven't thought of and uh, a little bit bigger, maybe biomechanics or something else. And you know, something you bring up is that I think it's, you know, it was a, a different group. It's mainly out of osteoarthritis that we really learned that 
people respond differently to even efficacious treatments. So even a really good treatment approach, if you have a spectrum of maybe 20 people, you're going to get a variability in response with that. And that's just normal human nature. Even with, with drugs like pharmacological agents, you'll see variability in response. Knowing that is a tremendous asset, I think, as a clinician, that you have to be adaptable and recognize there isn't one thing that's going to help everybody. Um, no, and we learn that from a different from a different discipline, basically. But I think we can learn a lot from other areas. Yeah, that's great. So, Chad, you know, you speak to the the concepts that you've been exposed, right, in in so many different areas and seeing so many different uh, professionals and disciplines and the way they're approaching things from basic scientists to biomechanists, right, and and, and imaging and and all of these things. And I would even think with your extensive teaching in over 40 different countries, you know, what international perspectives have also influenced maybe our scaffolding and, and how could this have a global educational approach to, you know, orthopedic manual therapy as we're thinking about this framework um, and its relevance, you know, across not just maybe the U.S. and the, our listeners, but maybe across the world. So I'll first start by saying, well, I'm going to answer it two ways. Uh, the first way <laughs> is that regardless of where I'm at, and I have been very blessed to speak in many countries, very fortunate, um, is a PT is a PT is a PT. Uh, you can pick a physio out across the road and say, that's, that's a physio. I can tell by the way they, they stand, the way they look, and how, op how very observational they are, the way they interact with people. It doesn't matter where you're at. They're, the, they're stamped out of the same um, mold, basically. Probably the biggest thing that has... Um, influenced me from my international experiences is that, and I, and this is not a shot toward North America, but I think other countries are more curious and it's probably self, it's a selection bias because they're usually coming to my courses or at the conference or something like that, but they're very, very curious on what is happening here. Why does it work? What do I need to know? What's the right thing to say to a patient? What happens if somebody doesn't get better? What, what does that typically mean? What, what could be some of the reasons for that? Um, that part has been fuel for me to continue to, um, to look for that, to look for those answers and to be able to, to actually give those and say, here's, here's some of the things that um, it could mean. And I think if there's anything, you know, the pain science uh, revolution has brought us is, is, is an understanding that, um, that there will be differences in your outcomes and people are going to respond differently and, and having an underlying understanding of why that might be the case. Um, so the big one for me internationally is, is the curiosity piece. It's just it, that part has been uh, re very rejuvenating for me, I think. Yeah. And I'm, I'm curious, like, why? Like, what is it that, you know, what, what stems their curiosity differently maybe than the U.S.? Is it a time? Is it a productivity? Is it what's the modeling that, you know, I, I'm just, you know, I think about factors, like why would you see such a difference? Do you have any idea? Um, I think you brought it up. So now I'm asking. <laughs> I think it's a lot of different things. I think part of it is the payment systems are different. So in many cases, uh, in, in social environments, they're not incentivized to necessarily see more people or, or anything like that. They're more incentivized um, by their own passions to just do a good job. Um, in other environments, it is very much fee for service and they have to deliver a superior product or that person's going to go a couple door, you know, doors down and go to a different place because most of the places are privately owned and, you know, they hang their shingle out and hope that they can have a, a strong uh, base with that. In other cases too, physio is a young profession in some of these countries. So it's very much in the growing phase. I would argue that it's similar to what we were like in the eighties and nineties. Um, when everybody went to Con Ed, you would go to five or six different major Con Ed courses in a year and you had um, your employers would pay for it because they wanted you to grow as a clinician. So I, I see those parallels, but, you know, obviously I don't know the actual answer, but that's kind of what I think. Yeah, that's a great point. Great point. So now I'm going to transition back to the U.S. and the education side on our side because I think we've hit some concepts around the clinical side, right? Curiosity, you know, it stems from somewhere. Um, they've had some training, some basic training. So before students leave, like, so let's go back to that maybe entry-level education. 
Um, how do you envision some of the work that you're doing now or that you anticipate doing and, and hopefully some of the outcomes from that? How do you see that shaping or, or um, I would say helping to reframe maybe entry level curricula or even early post-professional curricula? So whether it's, you know, fellowship level or even um, as, as students are kind of in those certificate courses before they go into fellowships? Well, I would hope it has a blueprint that's similar to exercise science uh, and that, you know, you, you have these exercise prescription. This is what we know, what happens with exercise. Here are the mechanisms. Here's what it can actually influence in a person's disease mechanisms. Here's how, it, you know, its role during an inflammatory process, etc. So providing a framework, providing a taxonomy around application of how you would use it. That's my goal. If, if there's that, and then that could be part of that educational process. And so that there's everybody's kind of on common ground, then the treatment part of it, the application part of it can take whatever flavor the educator wants. Um, you know, my concern right now is that when I look at manual therapy, especially in a, in a an entry level requirement, it's a lot of techniques mm -hmm. and it's not a lot of structure or understanding on when and um, how to use it. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think that's, you know, something that we could go further on. So if they were to do right, we, we all teach orthopedics or musculoskeletal, right? And so there's a desire for students to know how to do things with their hands. And I think what you've, what you've said is that it's just as important to really understand some of the understanding of the mechanisms that we understand and how it may work in that um, clinical approach. So the reasoning pieces to that may be helpful. Is there anything else that beyond reasoning that you feel like that really should be a focus of these entry level programs? Well, I think we need to understand where the manual therapies actually fit within the healthcare paradigm. Um, and, uh, you know, I do, I teach some health service, I teach a health services course at Duke and in the health services course, we talk about the different approaches. One of them is stepped care. I'm a firm believer that um, safe interventions, low cost interventions, non-invasive interventions, like the manual therapies, exercise, et cetera, it should be an early option for people with musculoskeletal problems. So understanding where it fits in that care process for the bulk of our patients with musculoskeletal problems that should be an, a, an essential teach, I think, in entry-level programs, but also reinforced in postgraduate programs that we, we really have a role and, you know, I would argue a responsibility to make sure that everybody was following those um, preferred paradigms. And right now, stepped care, I think, is probably the, the best option with it, within that framework. Yeah, that's great. So... Let me ask you kind of a wrapping up question. Where do we learn more? And I mean, you've said listening maybe to different um, authors or going outside of our own comfort zones a little bit and, and maybe listening to others that may have interest. Obviously, ForceNet is a group um, and you guys have some podcasts that go, or not podcasts, but some different speakers that come onto your um, your group that you do. Where else can our, our audience or listeners gain more information, things that you would recommend, maybe next steps from them beyond today's talk? Well, the first step, I think, is um, keep an eye on some of our publications that will be coming out pretty soon. We have two in review and plus one. Um, we have another one in the International Journal of Osteopathic Medicine, and then two more that we'll be submitting very soon that are really built around this concept of here is the, here's the scaffolding of what you need to know. Uh, ForceNet is a great place to start. We have a number of free webinars that are um, online that you can listen to. We, we throw so many different um, educators in those webinars. They're absolutely outstanding. That's actually been one of our, our best pieces, I think, of ForceNet. We actually have an online manual therapy conference in February, February 22nd, 2025. It's called Converge 2025. And in this conference, we have invited all different diff disciplines that work with, um, it's called force-based manipulations, but it's manual therapy. So this would go run the gamut from the basic scientist who works in mouse studies, all the way to the clinician who has a full schedule of patients that they use manual therapy with. And, and we will have different tracks, but keep an eye on that. It's on our ForceNet website. We'll be advertising for that very soon. 
I think that'll be really interesting. The tracks are going to be imaging. They're going to be the clinician and mechanisms. There's going to be a, um, a neuroscientist track, and then there's actually going to be a modeling track too. Oh, that's very cool. Very cool. Well, Chad, I think you just accomplished all that in one week. I mean, what are you going to do next week at this point? So, I mean, you're going to have like eight papers in one week already. So you're one of the most productive productive scholar researchers I've ever you're, met. You're so. exaggerating. Sorry. Oh, I am not. I am not. <laughs> Listeners, you all know I, I, I will not lie to you. But um, I so appreciate your time, Chad. And thank you for just making some time to have conversation about all the cool stuff you're doing. Um, introducing our listeners to scaffolding, right? Ways to navigate these trails um, and trials and, and challenges in, in um, orthopedic man PT. As we know, it's about finding the right balance, right? And I think this relates to your biking and, and navigating the trails that you have navigated for us because you truly are a pioneer in what we do. And so thank you for all of your dedication to the profession and hard work, being inspired by our young, our, our young uh, attendees at conferences or continuing ed courses challenging you to learn more and then help educate us more. And so we're grateful that you do that work. Um, you know, I think that there is a perfect understanding that we do have to find balance between theory and practice. Um, I don't think there's just a right one right size. And I really appreciate you giving us some insight into other ways, other areas and ways that we can get more information, be thoughtful about other disciplines as we, we grow as our understanding about how we can be better at manual therapy and its application. So thank you for that today. Appreciate well, thank it. Thank you for having me. Always. So Chad, we're grateful that you are here. We are grateful that we get to see you in our upcoming conference at AOM. So um, yeah, I get to put that AOM chat on and say, I get to see you soon. Um, and we're presenting together again. So that will be very fun. Um, and I look forward to having you in Orlando and listen, so many of our listeners are going to show up there too. So we're really excited for that. Um, and for those who aren't there, Chad gave you another opportunity to catch up on the ForestNet website and uh, see when their conference is coming up in February. Um, so you can learn more about those manipulation opportunities and learn um, how you might broaden your horizons a little bit further. So thank you for your time today. And we will catch you on our next uh, podcast. And again, remember, hands on or hands off. We'll figure it out. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Have a good one.